Okay, so it looks like we have almost all of our attendees here. And again, I apologize about that technical difficulty I had. Um, so I was just going to mention some of our Zoom features that we have that will help enhance our virtual book launch experience today. Um, so first we have the Q&A, and you're going to find that at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we ask that you uh, provide questions throughout March's presentation today. And I am going to be uh, monitoring the uh, Q&A throughout the presentation. And following Marcia's talk, I'm going to be sharing some of her, your questions with her for her to answer today. Um, you'll also notice the chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can use this chat if you have any technical questions or questions about today's event. Um, only I can see that chat, so please do limit your questions and comments there to technical or event-related issues. Um, however, I can share information with you using this chat. So I'm going to be using uh, the chat in order to share contact information for local bookstore Green Heron Books. Um, for anyone local to Brantford, you can actually purchase your copy of Trapped in Hitler's Web, and that will include um, a signed um, booklet for you as well. All right, so now that we have those details out of the way, uh, today we have the pleasure of hearing Marcia share a little bit about her latest book, um, oh, and of course, time for some of your questions. So as many of you know, Marcia has, um, she published her debut novel, Silver Threads, in 1996, and has gone on to publish more than 20 works of fiction and nonfiction. Um, she is particularly well known for her Second World War books, including Stolen Child, Making Bombs for Hitler, and Underground Soldier. Her latest book, Trapped in Hitler's Web, was released earlier this month, and it is now available for purchase. Um, and it is also available for borrowing at the Brantford Public Library. So welcome, Marcia, and I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, Anna. And I'm really honored that the Brantford Public Library is sponsoring this event because it was because of the Brantford Public Library that I learned how to read when I was nine years old, when the library was on uh, George Street. I used to visit it all the time, and I took uh, Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens out as a nine-year-old dyslexic and used it to teach me how to read. And so I love the library, and I also do a lot of um, research through the library and also using the online databases from the Brantford Public Library. It's a great resource. For those of you who are American, you may have been confused by the titles of my other books. So in the United States, uh, my World War II trilogy was Making Bombs for Hitler, The War Below, and uh, um, Don't Tell the Nazis. So Canada and the U.S. had different titles for a while there. From now on, the titles will be the same, which makes it a lot easier for me because I don't like forgetting the titles of my own books. But um, we're, today we're talking about Trapped in Hitler's Web, and it is uh, a companion novel to Don't Tell the Nazis or Don't Tell the Enemy. And I didn't think that I was going to write this book. When I wrote Don't Tell the Enemy, um, I thought it was a standalone book. And I wrote it from the point of view of Christia, who in that book was the oldest sister, and she and her mother um, hid their Jewish friends underneath the kitchen floor in their um, small town in um, Ukraine uh, to hide them. To, in, in, um, they wanted to protect them uh, from the Nazis. In that book, Christia had a sister named Maria, and I did this device, and any of you who are um, writers, you know that sometimes you have to do a device. I couldn't have two sisters similar in age in the same book and tell a story and have them both do similar things because it just makes a lot of words and, and doesn't move the story forward. So what I had done in that book is um, I sent her as a, a slave laborer to Austria and she went with Nathan. Now, um, the real Christia did have uh, an aunt who did that exact thing. But Maria, the real Maria, did not go with Nathan. So the second book ended up being, it is uh, historical fiction. Every single thing in the book happened to someone, but it did not happen to Maria. But Nathan did escape. Um, he did use uh, um, uh, papers that had been from a Ukrainian who had been killed by the Soviets. And so the underground army, the Ukrainian insurgent army, was able to change the uh, uh, documentation so that it had, had his photograph instead of the, of the dead boy's photograph. And that boy ended up surviving. So there's um, 
some uh, real people that it's based on, but then other parts, it's, that's where the fiction part comes in. But the, way, the reason that I was inspired to write this story is because of my own uh, father-in-law, John Skripik. He was a young person. He was in his teens during World War II. And when the uh, Nazis invaded in uh, 1941, he was in this situation. He was like in the middle of a horrible situation because the Soviets had been occupying that area originally, and now the Nazis were coming. And he was a, a young man. He was also university educated. He was training to be a physician, a medical doctor. And uh, so he was almost killed by the Soviets because just as the Soviets were leaving and just as the Nazis were coming in, the Soviets were killing all of the educated Ukrainians because they felt that these could be future leaders of an independent Ukraine. And so there is this thing that went down in our family lore, uh, Skripik family lore, about how close it was that he um, almost was killed by the Soviets, even before the Nazis got there. He was leaving his own house. And just as he was leaving his house, the NKVD, which is the um, uh, Soviet secret service, the same as the Gestapo uh, you know, equivalent of uh, the Nazis, was coming to his house to arrest him and kill him. And they went like this. Somehow he was able to, to go and they came and he was gone and it was just an absolute miracle. And in fact, in the family, the, the way that um, my husband's uh, cousins talk about it is that it was the intervention of the Virgin Mary because it just doesn't even, it's just such um, a miracle that he was able to escape. And so what he did, and he had no idea who or what the Nazis would be up to, but he didn't want to stick around for another army because he figured he'd get, um, they would want to kill him too. So he hopped on a train and went all the way to Germany. And he was hiding in plain sight, working from farm to farm to farm, trying to stay away from the war, trying to stay away from the killing as much as he could and just working on farms. He did grueling, horrific labor. By the end of the war, he got to a, a displaced person camp and he was almost uh, dead of typhus and starvation. But they found out, uh, like uh, um, the Americans and uh, the allies found out that he had some medical training. So they let him take, uh, finish his medical degree, but only to work on people like him, like uh, refugees. And after that, he came to Canada. So this was a story that I knew about that I had never read in books. And so I thought, well, um, Nathan and Maria in Trapped in Hitler's Web, this is basically what they're doing. They're, they're walking into like the heart of Hitler's Reich, thinking that this is going to be a safer place for them during a war. And it was, because if Nathan and Maria stayed in their home village, uh, if my father-in-law stayed in his home village, they would have probably been killed. It was horrible for Jews because Hitler wanted to kill 100% of Jews who were in uh, that area, what is now Poland and Ukraine. That was what the Nazis wanted to do, was to kill every single Jew. In terms of Ukrainians and Poles, who the Nazis used the racist term of Slavs, um, they can, he considered them subhuman and he wanted to kill uh, three out of every four. And the last one that would be stayed, that could stay alive would be treated as a slave. And so I also knew myself in all the books that I have written and in all the people that I have interviewed, many, many people who were slave laborers during World War II, but it wasn't a story that was really told in novels. I wrote Making Bombs for Hitler about one category of those slaves. They were called Osterbiters. They were the Eastern workers. So they were the part of, they came from the part of Ukraine mostly, and also the Soviet Union that had been under Soviet occupation for a long time. Um, and then when the Nazis uh, um, attacked, they were in the eastern part of uh, occupied territory. But the people who were in the western part of occupied territory were not called Osterbiters. They, were, um, uh, they wore the letter P, and it didn't matter what nationality they were, they could be Ukrainian, and they would wear the letter P. So I thought that it would be, um, this was my opportunity to find out more myself with research about what, what people who wore the letter P, uh, how they were treated um, on farms. And uh, I had assumed it would be better, 
I didn't realize just how awful it was. But I also found out that there are levels of victimhood that I just didn't even imagine. And so doing this book, doing the research for this book, just opened up a whole new world for me that I didn't know. And um, those of you who have read Making Bombs for Hitler, I just wanted to mention a connection because um, in Making Bombs for Hitler, in Lita's uh, barracks, there are uh, people in there who are wearing the letter P, just like Maria uh, and Nathan had to do in Trapped in Hitler's Web. So they are from the Western part of Ukraine and they're treated slightly differently in Making Bombs for Hitler than what Lita is being from the East. And then in Trapped in Hitler's Web, again, it kind of goes like this because on the farm, uh, Frau Huber, who is the farmer, um, uh, she has people coming in from a concentration camp, a work camp, to work on her farm. And they have um, the Ost on them. And then they go back at night and go to, back to their, their camp. So for me as an author to be able to sort of meld these two stories that they don't have any of the same characters, but it is a shared history in many ways. So for me, that was uh, a really neat connection to be able to do. Now I'm gonna stop talking right now because I'm hoping that you have questions for me and I would rather answer questions than just be this talking head right now. All right, so we definitely have some questions coming in. Um, I'll just remind everyone that we are really encouraging lots of questions and you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. But we have a first couple of questions. So our first question for you, Marcia, is um, how did you come up with the title? That's a really good question. How did I come up with the title? Oftentimes when I'm writing a book, I'll have a title in my head. I mean, you have to save a, a Word document, right? So I usually have what I think is going to be the title of the book as the Word document. But then as I'm writing the book, the book tells me what um, they want, like the book tells me what it wants my title to be. So I started this book, uh, I initially called it Hiding in Plain Sight. And that ended up being um, this, the title of chapter one instead. And then I would as I was getting into the book and as I was getting into the research and also the nuances between the characters, I realized it was more than that. And it was like being stuck in a spider's web that every single time you turned around, tried to get anywhere, there was this other like web work that you just could not get out of. And this didn't just apply to Nathan and it didn't just apply to Maria. It even applied to the Aryans who uh, owned the farm and the various generations on the farm, and even the various people who were Aryan um, had these levels of control put on them that I hadn't been aware of before because my earlier books had all been set in occupied territory, not in Aryan territory. So for me, the whole idea of uh, a web, a web work, and being stuck in the middle of it uh, told me that that's what the title had to be. Oh, well, that's so interesting. I think we really appreciate hearing more about um, how you come up with that title. Um, so we have lots more questions coming in. Um, so our next question for you is, um, do you think you'll make Trapped in Hitler's Web and Don't Tell the Nazi um, a trilogy? Yes, it already is a trilogy. I finished the third book and the third book will be coming out in the fall of 2021. I think the title is Traitors Among Us. I'm saying I think because it's still a year from now and that's, I didn't come up with that title. I wanted the title to be called I Am Not a Hitler Girl and the publishers did not like it. So I have two publishers. I have Scholastic Canada and Scholastic Inc. So one is American, one is Canadian and they, they didn't like the title and uh, so they came up with this one. And actually, I, I think it's it's absolutely bang on. I love it, Traitors Among Us. Oh, wow. So it sounds like um, the titles can maybe be a little bit of a collaborative process too. <laughs> they, they often are. And I mean, the same thing, uh, books that are published in the US and books that are published in Canada have different readerships. And so sometimes a title that would work for one country isn't necessarily going to work for the other, which is why some of my titles were changed. Um, so Stolen Girl and Stolen Child, to, it even has a different feel to it. Um, but like ironically, Stolen Girl is what I had initially called my book Stolen Child, 
but then it was published in Canada as Stolen Child. And so when it was published in the U.S. as Stolen Girl, I'm thinking, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Okay, we have lots more questions. So let's move on to our next question. Um, this one is, how do you become an author? How do you become an author? Okay, that's a very good question. One of the things that you need to do to become an author is read a lot of books. And I would suggest one of the first things that you need to do if you haven't already is to get a library card. Uh, because you don't, as long as you have a library card, it's like this key to an entire universe. So you need to read a lot and you need to read a lot of different books. So you can't just read, for example, historical fiction, read science fiction, read uh, graphic novels, read comic books, read instruction manuals, read everything. But set a goal for yourself to read about a thousand books before you decide that you're going to write a book. Um, at the same time, I would suggest that you write for 10 minutes every single day, starting today. And this isn't something for school. And it's not something to show your parents this is or your friends this is for you so write keep a journal it's not necessarily a diary but write every single day and that will change your head uh, you it'll change your thinking process and make you into a writer but in terms of getting a book published by a publisher it is a very long process and my first book was uh, rejected over a hundred times and then it never got published the way that I wrote it and I ended up tearing it apart, rewriting it into five different books that did get published all individually. So you have to have a thick skin and you have to be a really hard worker and you have to also be um, okay with the fact that most people will think you're doing nothing because when you're writing, all you do is say you can't do this and you can't do that because everybody's doing something fun and you're at home writing. So just like, you know, if you wanna be a writer, then you have to accept the fact that you'll spend a lot of time alone doing research and writing. I always like answers that include reading lots of books and boring books from the library, but it sounds like um, you really have to be a dedicated person to pursue a writing career. Um, so we have another question for you today. Uh, this next question is, when did you, begin, did you begin your interest in writing about war? Well, that's a really good question. And I do consider myself um, a, a writer of war for young people. And the reason that I like to write about war, I, I loathe war, but I admire the spirit of humans who are able to overcome uh, evil and also to uh, overcome their own fears. And I think that war gives people the chance to show the best side of themselves. So if I followed, let's say Anna, I followed you around all day and I wrote ev down every single thing that you did. And please don't take this the wrong way, but if I made a book out of that, it would be boring. <laughs> yeah. And if you do interesting things, it's gonna be boring because there's only so many interesting things that you can do that would make it into a novel, right? But if all of a sudden um, we were plunged in war here in Brantford, Ontario, and you took a, a key part of protecting a whole group of people, then suddenly writing about you and the circumstances would be much more interesting. So what I like to do is to write about regular people who are plunged in the midst of extraordinary times. The other thing I like to do is take things about people that other people might criticize them for, so might be considered a weakness. And I like to show how you, um, or my characters can empower themselves by flipping that around and exploiting their own weakness to become their strength. So for example, in Trapped in Hitler's Web, uh, her strength turned out to be the fact that she was considered a subhuman. And when um, her area was being bombed, only the people who were Aryan were allowed to go into the bomb shelter. She was not allowed to go into the bomb shelter. They closed the door left her out. But because she was out, she realized that this was the one time she could get food because she was stealing it, but they weren't feeding her. So she was able to get food. So she turned that into a strength. She also found that when it was time for her and her sister to escape, they escaped while all the Aryans were hiding in bomb shelters. So she flipped it around and made her weakness her strength. 
Oh, that's such an interesting response. This next question is actually from someone different, but I think it's a good follow-up question. This one is, why did you get started writing about World War II and not World War I? Well, I have written about World War I. I've written probably as many books set in World War I as I have World War II, but they're not as well known. Okay. Uh, uh, so my very first book was Silver Threads, and it's about my own grandfather in Canada, uh, World War I, who was interned as an enemy alien in Canada. Uh, I have a whole trilogy. There's uh, The Hunger, Nobody's Child, and Daughter of War. They're set in World War I in the Ottoman Empire, which is now Turkey. And I deal with very similar things that I write with in my World War II novels. It's about the treatment of a minority group um, under the cover of war. So at that time, the Ottoman Empire was rounding up minorities and killing them because they could, because no one was paying attention because a war was happening. The people most affected were the Armenians. It was also the Greeks. And I wrote that story because no one else was. The same thing goes with Silver Threads, that my book Silver Threads was the first work of fiction to be written about internment of Ukrainians in World War II. Uh, my book Making Bombs for Hitler was the first book to be written, uh, novel, to be written about an Osterbiter. So I choose my topics uh, because no one else chose them. Very interesting. Okay, this next question is maybe changing gears a little bit, um, but this next question is, could you describe your research process? I love talking about research. So one of the things that I try to do uh, as an initial part of research is I try to interview people face to face, if I can, who have had similar experiences to what my characters have. That's not always possible. And as time goes on, it is even more po impossible because people who lived through World War II, many of them have passed away. But over the last uh, 25 years, I have been doing face-to-face -face interviews with people who were just like Maria and Nathan in Trapped in Hitler's Web and escaped in similar ways uh, as they did and survived day to day, similar to the way that they did. I also have been collecting uh, diaries, memoirs, letters, photographs from people just like Nathan and Maria so that I can uh, go back to them and look things up. It really helps. But more than that, I try to never only have a single or a dual point of view because I think in many ways that uh, misrepresents the past. So I also look at diaries and memoirs from people who were uh, uh, Soviet, like so Soviet soldiers, for example, even NKVD officers. I also look at Nazi officers and Nazi soldiers and see if I can find memoirs, diaries from them. Also civilians, so uh, Austrian civilians, German civilians of the time, because you need to get like a fully fleshed out idea of where uh, your characters lived. Now, after I do that, I do this other thing and I'll take any character in my book needs to have a 24-hour day in my head because otherwise I don't know who they are. So I brainstorm just on a pad of paper 24 hours of a typical day for my character. And so once I have done that, and usually you can often do it before everything changed and then after everything changed. Once you do that, you have enough story in your head that you're able to start writing. And then the thing is, is to choose what of all that massive material you're going to put in the book. Because of course, the, if I put everything in, the book would be like that big and it's only this big. So you have to be very selective and choose the scenes that really showcase uh, the story progression. So our next question um, that I have for you is, how do you mold the story for um, a middle grade audience? You work with some pretty tough topics, so how do you mold that for a middle grade audience? Well, uh, I can write on more sophisticated topics because I'm writing for young people than I could if I were writing for adults. That's why I choose to write for young people because young people are uh, interested in more nuanced topics. The unfortunate fact is that a lot of adults have already uh, closed their minds to any kind of new ideas. Uh, adults often are only interested in reading for entertainment anyway. 
So for example, if I was going to write Trapped in Hitler's Web uh, for adults, I would have had to make uh, my characters older. There would have had to be a deep romance between the two of them. It would have had a whole different thing. And so instead of uh, like the real stuff that these people do, it would have just been like a historical romance because that's what adults want to read when they're reading uh, historical fiction. Now that's not to say that there's not a romantic aspect to this book, but the emphasis is completely different for adult and kid. The other thing is that if you're writing for an adult, oftentimes the key person in the story um, is so victimized that I feel that that person has been re-victimized. And to give you an example, a lot of times, you know, uh, an adult novel will start with a dead body, right? And then the whole story is about how that, that person ended up dying. But they're not, I mean, they're the key person, but they don't even have a life. Whereas in um, uh, fiction for young people, the, the reader is put into the shoes of a person who is being mistreated. And I think that that uh, builds empathy in the reader. I do not think that a lot of adult fiction, especially con, um, con, uh, commercial fi fiction for adults, it does not build empathy, it builds distance. I want to build empathy, but the real reason that I write for young people is because everybody who writes has a voice and you can't change your real voice. And my voice happens to be 12. I am 65 how old am I? I'm 65. But I, my inner self is 12. So that's what I have to write from. If I want to be authentic with my voice, then I have to write from that inner voice. Oh, that's so interesting. I think this next question uh, might have to relate with your, your inner voice um, and when, uh, when you decided to become an author. So this question is how old were you when you decided to become an author? After I read Oliver Twist, when I was nine, that's when I decided that I was going to be an author myself. I didn't actually call it wanting to be an author, I just wanted to write books. Uh, I realized how uh, powerful books were, because before that, when I was trying to learn how to read, or trying to avoid to have anybody realize that I couldn't read, I guess was the better way of putting it, it was because I didn't really even understand what books were all about, that um, you were plunged into this movie that's free in your head. And so once I read Oliver Twist, and it was the first time I actually had one of those free movies in my head, as opposed to the books that I'd read before that were really instructional. They were just teaching me how to read, so there was no story there. So once I realized that, I wanted to do that myself. So for me, reading and writing are really, they activate the same part in my brain. So if I can find a book um, on a topic, a novel on a topic that I'm really fascinated by, I will read it. But if I'm really fascinated in a topic and I cannot find any book on that topic, then I must write it. And so that's why I have ended up writing so many books on World War II, for example, and also aspects of World War I. But I wrote the very first book, I considered it my first book, it was never published when I was in grade eight. It was uh, 64 pages long and it had chapters. And it was called Underground to Canada. And it was about uh, two young people in the Southern United States who had escaped from slavery and they came to Canada for freedom. Doesn't that sound exactly like every other book I've ever written? So I haven't really changed since I was a kid. Since I was a 12 year old, I'm still writing the same kinds of stories. So this next question might be a tricky one, but this question is, um, what is your favorite book that you have written? Well, I can't really say what a favorite book is because I love them all. But since I just finished writing Trapped in Hitler's Web, and it just came out. It's like it's Trapped in Hitler's Web's birthday, practically. So because Trapped in Hitler's Web is a birthday girl, I will say that she is my favorite book right now. Um, and the thing that I love about Trapped in Hitler's Web is it does tell a story about a time and place that no one has ever written about before in a novel. But it was also about a time and a place that I had to do so much research for, even though I had written so many 
uh, World War II novels because this one takes place in Austria on a farm in 1942. I've never been in 1942. None of my previous books had taken place in 1942. Many had taken place in 1941 or 1943. It's quite different. So the challenge for writing this book and the things that I learned from writing this book make it my current favorite right now. I think that's a very diplomatic answer. <laughs> um, so we talked a little bit about your research process and your inspiration for the book, but our next question asks, how long does it take you to write a book? Um, do the words just flow out of you? The words flow and then they get deleted and then they flow again and then they get deleted. Um, usually the first two chapters of a book that I'm writing, and this includes Trapped in Hitler's Web, it happened, I write them over and over and over and over and over and I will make myself sit and write for three hours a day. And so at the beginning of a novel, um, I sit and I'm staring at the same words for like weeks on end, maybe even months on end. And then finally something happens where it starts to click and then I can write forward. So um, it doesn't get easier. Like even though I've had over 20 books published, it, it really doesn't get easier. It's a lot of hard work writing a book, but uh, deadlines help. So if I have a deadline, then I can get the book done to whatever deadline that is. So I had a book in the past where I had to write the entire thing in a month and I did it. I don't think I'd ever want to do that again because it just about killed me. Uh, but I, it usually will take about six months for me to write the first draft of a novel and then about a year to do um, the edits back and forth with my editor from the publisher. So, but like those six months consist of two, two months probably of writing the first two chapters and then the rest of the time writing the rest of it because then I'm off and running and I can just like, um, you know, I'm skipping along because the story is telling me what it, what it needs to be. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, our next couple of questions are about your reading life. So this next question is, what is your favorite book? I don't have a favorite book um, because I read so voraciously. There are a couple of books that uh, I have really loved recently. And so, for example, Marina Cohen, she writes um, scary novels for children. And uh, so she, a recent book by her is Box of Bones. Oh, it is so scary. Seeing as Halloween is coming up, I highly recommend it. There's another book that I've read recently, again, by a friend of mine, and her name is Natalie Hyde, and the book is called Mine. And uh, it's wonderful. And it's, it's about this boy and his father who want to go up to the um, up north northern Canada to find a mine a gold mine that's supposed to be in their family and Natalie has a, a new book out that continues that story and I, don't ask me the name you'll have to look it up but I want to read it as well and um, uh, my friend Valerie Sherard she has written some really beautiful books and my favorite of hers is The Glory Wind so I do read a lot of uh, fiction for young people. I also do read uh, adult fiction and I'm a, a book reviewer. So oftentimes I'm writing, reading books that aren't out for another year. So even if I told you the books, it wouldn't help. But I like to read personal memoirs and I like to read uh, um, history that isn't of a time that I've read. And I also like to read thrillers. You know, those ones that I was criticizing about the dead body? I read those. Very nice. Um, great. So let's see. We have a couple more questions here. Um, let's see. Some of them are fairly similar. So I think we've covered lots and lots of these questions so far. Um, I guess our next question is, um, do you have anything to say about the cover of uh, Trapped in Hitler's Web? The, the cover is absolutely beautiful. I love this cover. So um, all of the books since Scholastic Inc. has been doing the artwork, they have this certain look. So the, um, the, all the words kind of go downwards and they're like in this bright red. And so the new Making Bombs for Hitler, it's the same way too. And so I like to think of that as the Marsha look. 
And so I, I really do love it. And I love that on Trappers, Trapped in Hitler's Web, they have um, the dog on the cover, Max, because uh, the dog plays a really important role in this book. And so when I saw this book the first time and I saw that they got the dog on there, I was just absolutely thrilled by that. Um, one of my sisters, uh, Lara, one of my younger sisters, Lara, is um, a dog nut. And uh, she knows everything that there is about dogs. And so I've often asked her for advice to make sure that when I write a dog character, I, I get it right. Um, so for me to have the dog on this, it, it was just absolutely perfect because it reflects the story so nicely. Oh, very cool. Um, so we've had a couple of questions kind of along these lines, but I'll just read out this one. Um, did your view of any character change as you were creating them for this book? How and why? That's a really good question. And yes, uh, characters, if they don't change for you, then it means that you didn't get into their heads and you're only in your own head. And also if they don't change for you as you're writing, it means that you are stuck in your own prejudices. So when I started writing this book, uh, dare I admit that I had hostile feelings towards uh, the Aryans in my story. And uh, that's bad on my part. It shows intolerance on my part. But please understand, I've written so many books about people who were Aryan who have done atrocities. As I was writing this book, I realized what a lot of people who were considered Aryan by Hitler were confronted with. And so, yes, many did bad things, but many who were Aryans were also victimized. And so for me, that changed because my characters, I realized that there's almost this hierarchy in terms of age, in terms of how well the propaganda that Hitler had worked. So on the oldest people, so there are grandparents in this story, the propaganda didn't work as well on them. And so they were much more sympathetic characters. But I didn't think that they would be. And at the beginning, they absolutely were not. Like when I first started writing, I was thinking that they would be the worst. And the people who were, um, uh, that the Nazis were able to best propagandize to and who bought into Nazism the best were unfortunately the young people. That shocked me because I was thinking it would be the opposite. But when you are uh, writing historical fiction, you have the responsibility to leave your mind open to the actual facts. And so if you don't let yourself be wrong and let yourself be corrected, then you have no purpose writing a book. You don't have the right to write a book as far as I'm concerned. Um, you, you need to have the responsibility of letting yourself go and your own preconceived ideas go and letting um, the actual circumstances of the time fill you with what happened. I have a, another really interesting um, question about characters. Um, so this question is, do you include real people in your books alongside fictional characters? If yes, how do you weave fiction and nonfiction together? So a lot of people think that fiction means it's fake and nonfiction means it's true. And that's not the case. When I write historical fiction, every single thing in my books has actually happened. And every single thing that a character does, someone did. The difference is that uh, when I write historical fiction, I choose to make it fiction because I can't interview every single person that I create a character from and so I don't have the moral authority to put words into their mouths if I call them by their real name. So given that, I create a character based on them, but I take a little bit of this person, a little bit of that person, and I combine them up and I, and I make my own character, but every single thing that they did happened. Now, that is different than something that I do for a book like this. Too Young to Escape. It, this one won the red, uh, the yellow cedar award in Ontario last fall, uh, last uh, June. It also won the red cedar award in um, uh, British Columbia. So it's like the Reader's Choice Award. This is narrative nonfiction. Everything that happened in this book actually happened, and uh, I was able to 
write it with Van Ho, who was the little girl in the book who escaped from Vietnam, uh, who was initially left behind and then um, uh, escaped subsequently after her entire family had left, had to leave her behind for horrific reasons. But I was able to write chapter by chapter, and then as I'm writing it, send it to her and say, these are, these are this, the, the words that I put in your mouth, please correct them. And so she could go through and say, I would never say something like that and cross it out. Or she could take another one and, and rework it. So that is the difference. But this book reads like a novel. So you read it, there's the same kind of story arc and everything else that's in a novel. But with Trapped in Hitler's Web, most of the people in the story have passed away. So I do not have the moral responsibility to take a real person, have their first name, their last name, where they live. I could even tell you where on a street they lived, but I don't have the moral authority to make them a character in my book. But um, when I hand in a manuscript to my publisher, it's in a Word document and I have footnotes all the way through and I've got a bibliography. So I prove to them that everything that happened did happen and I have all those references right there so that they can see that I'm not making it up, I looked it up. Um, so our next question I think is interesting considering that you do write about all these real experiences with real people um, and then create stories based on them. Um, so this question is, do you ever get emotional writing about war? Yes, very emotional. And uh, it's, it's also really difficult for me sometimes to do public readings. So like if I read a part of a novel that I've written, I have sometimes had to stop because I'm crying. And while I'm writing, oftentimes I just have to set it aside because I'm weeping as I'm writing it. But if that wasn't the case, then I don't think that the stories would be as good. And so it's, it does take an emotional toll on me, um, but it's something that I must do because otherwise I, I would not be respecting the real people who lived through that time. Uh, I wouldn't be showing it accurately if I wasn't emotionally involved as well. We've had so many really um, thoughtful questions and wonderful answers from you, Marcia. Um, so we still have a time for a few more questions. So please, um, if you do have any more questions, um, feel free to submit them through the Q&A. I'm just going to take a quick break here um, because Marcia has actually very generous generously shared copies of her books, um, of course, Trapped in Hitler's Web um, and Don't Tell the Enemy, to be given away through a prize draw today for a couple of lucky people who have joined us for today's virtual book launch. So our winners today are Micah R and Karen B. So congratulations. Um, yay! <laughs> You're going to receive an email from me uh, following this presentation, uh, just with some details on how to pick up your signed copies at the Brantford Public Library. So thank you so much, Marcia. That's quite exciting that you get to share your books with some of our uh, people who've joined us here today. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Congratulations. Okay, so um, this next question I think is for um, sort of aspiring writers, young and old. Um, how do you get the confidence to write? The confidence to write by thinking that no one is going to read it. So um, you have to do this thing where you make yourself a character, really, because most writers are very much introverts. You couldn't be an extrovert and write books because you wouldn't be able to spend that much time alone to actually get a book written. So I have to think when I'm writing that I'm only doing it for myself and that it's an it, it incredibly personal experience and that only I will read it. And I think that when you psych yourself into that, then it means that what you're writing is very authentic as well. And then, and then you share it with the world. And so then you have to create this other character. And I call that character extrovert Marsha. And it takes me a while to go from the writer to the extrovert Marsha, where I'm actually talking about all these things that for me are just so very personal. Um, but I don't really think about, uh, I don't really think about whether I have the talent to write or anything like that. It's because I know how, how many hundreds of times I had to write that one sentence. So it's not really a matter of inspiration, it is perspiration. And I know that I'm a hard worker. So if I can sit down for that length of time and I'll keep on doing it until I get it right, that is what I can do. And that was actually a gift that was given to me 
because I couldn't read as a kid. So I already know what failure is. I knew what failure was from the get-go because I was the dumbest kid in class. I failed grade four. So I already know what the bottom is. I've, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. So uh, what do I have to prove? If I write something and it's a dud, well, I either pick myself up and start all over again, or I revise it and keep on revising it ad nauseum. So it really doesn't come into the picture at all about whether I can do it or not. It's just whether I have the patience to redo it a million times. I think that's really encouraging for writers who are really dedicated and, and want to share their work with the world. And speaking of the world, our next question is kind of interesting. Um, this one is, do people around the world have different responses to your books? Uh, yes, they do. I want to show you a cover of, this is Making Bombs for Hitler from Korea. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Uh, and so like I've got books from all, this is a book from Japan. This is actually Hope's War in Japan. Oh, wrong side there. So it, it is neat to hear from people from different parts of the world. And so um, uh, Stolen Girl, Stolen Child was published in, um, uh, Portu in Portugal. And it was called Diary of a Young Girl Stolen. And it got really lousy reviews because everybody was saying, it's a great book, but it's not a diary. I never said it was a diary. For whatever reason, the publisher, the Portuguese publisher, decided to call it a diary. And for whatever reason, I guess the translator decided that it was going to be a diary. And so for me, that's frustrating. So I write a book and then it's translated into another language that I don't have control over because I don't speak that language. And the response from readers can be completely different because that wasn't something that I put into the book. It's the same thing with um, Hope's War in Japanese. The way I found out about that book, um, and that's another story in itself, that book was published without my permission, but we won't get into that. I, I did finally get paid for it, but the book was in the Tokyo Public Library and I didn't even know it. And I have a fair following in Japan for whatever reason. And this person emailed me and said, I'm really disappointed in the, the, the Japanese translation of your book because they got the names all uh, inaccurate, like they translated them very inaccurately. And then um, this person listed out what, the, what had been done in Japanese and, how, and why they were wrong. And so for someone who is the author of a book, it can be very disconcerting to see the different things that can happen in different um, countries. And also every country has its own um, culture and even English speaking countries. So uh, Canadian and American uh, readers are different. And so they may react to scenes differently in my books than each other. And so that makes it very interesting as well. So, you know, I try to write as universally as I can, but the people who are reading it bring their own cultural uh, um, experience to the readership, you know, to reading the book. Yeah, it sounds like there's an interesting balance between sharing your, your books with the world and then also issues with language and different cultural um, and norms. That's really a really interesting question. So we're just about at the end of our time today, but I have one kind of final question that I think is quite appropriate for coming to the close of our presentation today. So this one is, how do you feel, um, sorry, how do you feel um, when you are finished writing a book? When I finally am able to write the end, I am just so happy. And I think, oh, that is just so great. And then I always think, I don't even want to write another book because like that was so much work, right? But then about two days after that, I want to start another book because it's hard to, like if you've got the writer head, it's really hard to know what, like how normal people live and what they do with their time. And so I'm always anxious to like just itching to start on a new book. Um, now there was a question that I saw come up that I really would like to answer if we oh, do sure. have so it was a question, it was actually from um, Jackie, who uh, is a friend of mine. She took writing uh, workshop with me and she asked if um, uh, anything in my book relates to what is happening today. And absolutely, like, um, yes, 
because what was happening during uh, like in 1942 and to Maria and Nathan um, in uh, like in the Reich during Nazi times, the reason that the Nazis were able to stay so powerful for the length of time that they could was because they controlled information. And this is very much a problem now because like, yes, we have social media and yes, uh, everybody has a voice, but who do you believe? And so this is a problem. It is a problem. And how do you tell what's propaganda and what's news and what's information? And so during um, the time of Hitler and during the time of my story in particular, uh, the Nazis were able to control young people because by the time that they were age 10, they were enrolled in the Hitler youth if they, you know, had the Aryan ideal, like only the people that they wanted because everybody else was going to be killed or persecuted, right? But if they had the Aryan ideal, they were propagandized into thinking that other people were not human. And so there were like us and them. And I, um, it chills me right now to see this huge divide in our world right now where half of the population will accuse the other half of the population of not even being human. And I'm saying both sides, both sides, everybody's at fault for this. If there's someone that you won't talk to because you don't agree with the way that they think, try having a conversation. But the other thing is, try reading books. Because the other thing that the Nazis did was they burned books. So they had their propaganda, it was all over the place. Like shut down Twitter, just read books, read actual newspapers, don't read Reddit, don't read memes, read actual books, try history books to understand what's happening right now. But it, it is really scary for me because to me, it's like everything old was new again and we're doing the same kind of dividing of humans into hierarchies and groups and it's, you know, I really hope that we don't have World War III, but the way to stop that is to read a lot. Yeah, I think that's some really powerful wisdom and I think um, gives us a lot to think about as we kind of come to the end of our time together. Um, so I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who has joined us here today. Um, you really shared some wonderful questions, really thoughtful and interesting questions. Um, and of course, Marcia, thank you so much for um, joining us today to kind of share your inspiration behind uh, trapped in Hitler's web and, and give us those really thought provoking and interesting answers to all of the questions shared. Well, thank you for hosting this. It was an honor. Oh, wonderful. Yes. All right. So thank you. Thank you again to everyone for joining us today. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. See you later, you guys. Bye.